Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Uh, as Sean mentioned during this panel, we'll, we will be discussing the very important topic of how to go about finding funding to help take your intellectual property to the market. I am very excited to introduce our panelists, Wolf Starr and Patrick Dis Driscoll. Wolf, would you please go ahead and start us off and tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do in the funding um, with the LGBTQIA plus community? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Sean and Dan and everyone here for, for including us in this conversation. Uh, and also, Patrick, uh, this is going to be great for us to get a little bit more time together. So um, I'm Wolf. I'm one part of the team for the Pride Fund, which is uh, proudly the uh, first fund that only invested specifically into LGBTQIA plus individuals. Uh, but as our CEO Denzel likes to put it, the proudest part of that is that we're no longer the only. And so we we have a handful of um, sibling funds that also invest into underrepresented communities. But it was the Pride Fund where we got started. I uh, was was a product of the neighborhood. And when we realized that we had great partners like Gangels that were doing things in a different way that we could work with, uh, but there wasn't a specific set of funds uh, on the venture level, uh, we we saw the potential for us to help create uh, a space which was not only open and inclusive, but welcoming and and excited. So uh, today we've invested in some really really incredible companies, and we've got some wonderful wonderful partners across the country and beyond. And uh, we spend a lot of time looking at IP. And so when we got the call to come and participate, it was uh, very very exciting. So. Um, we're, we're glad to be here today and thank you for including us. Thank you and thank you for your work with the community. Uh, Patrick, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. For sure. Uh, my name is Patrick Driscoll and I know uh, Ben Stokes, my business partner was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, there uh, was an emergency that popped up. So uh, I'll, I, I, I'm the disappointing replacement, but hopefully I'll I'll be uh, up to par for what Ben will have brought to the table or would have brought to the table. I'm a general partner at Chasing Rainbows. So Ben and I both are general partners. It's an, an early stage LGBTQ plus focused fund. Similar to Pride Fund, we invest into founders and founding teams where one member is and mem one member has to be a LGBTQ plus uh, founder. We focus in the early stage. So pre-seed, seed, seed will go up to Series A. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco. I'll be actually relocating to Los Angeles, but we do invest across the US and have an allocation for international investments as well. We, Ben and I actually met in the greater ecosystem. There is quite a robust LGBTQ plus startup world out there. So we met via start out. I was actually emceeing a demo day in Los Angeles and Ben was pitching his company. And uh, we kind of hit it off there. Ben is an exited founder, so he knows the founder struggle and the founder journey, which is a fantastic perspective to have on an investment team. My background is more in venture capital operations. I worked with 500 Global 500, uh, previously known as 500 startups, and uh, ran a couple accelerators with the Department of Defense. So I'm familiar with the federal world, uh, worked with the US Small Business Administration as well. So. The USPTO is near and dear to my heart, and I am also thrilled to be here. I love to ask founders, specifically early stage, if they thought about intellectual property, and if they haven't, then it's a huge red flag for me, and if they have, then we can continue with the conversation. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Patrick, and we are happy to have you here. Uh, so now let's get to the questions and learn how to go about finding funding. Uh, I'd like to start us off with the basics and ask you to describe to us what it is, what is a venture backed business to help us understand what that means. Um, I'll keep the questions kind of open, so I'll keep the floor open if either either or both of you want to jump in. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at it and then pass it over uh, to our friend. Um, so one thing which we learned very quickly when we started the fund and i'll also point out that, that patrick's one of the first people we talked to when we started the fund um was that uh, there are not a lot of places where funding is as available for openly out members of the community 
And so when we got some really good media, we got a lot of calls from individuals that are amazing entrepreneurs that are uh, running everything from Pilates studios to coffee shops to restaurants and, and even some CPG companies that are doing amazing things and they're growing things in their community. They're creating jobs. They're bringing people together. Uh, however, uh, venture is not the right fit for them. And I think we'll go into this in detail later, but our, our, big mission is that venture capital is absolutely not the right fit for everybody, but needs to become equally accessible to anybody. And, and the part of that is based on the equality of it. But the other part is just understanding whether getting funding from an investor is the right fit for you or not. And so when I look at whether a company is venture scalable, the first question which I have is, is that company one that needs this funding? to be able to scale beyond what they could do without it. And our, our big joke around the office is if you don't need it, don't take it. And the only reasons to take it are if um, one, you, you need to scale, you need to grow so fast. And the only way to do that is to get that level of funding. Or if the investors are so strategic that they're able to get you further faster than you would be on your own. Uh, but I'll pass it over to Patrick to talk about uh, how they view a uh, venture scalable business. For sure. Thanks so much, Wolf. And I, I remember that conversation many moons ago. So uh, look, look where we are today. It's pretty wild to think about. But I, I love what you said. I, I typically will challenge a founder or somebody who I'm having an initial call with that if they actually need venture capital. A lot of people see venture capital VC, they think it's like the show Silicon Valley, it's super sexy, everybody wants it, yada, yada. However, you're giving up equity in your company. Uh, it might not be the best fit for you. There are so many other uh, resources for capital, whether it be debt, whether it be grants, et cetera, that a lot of folks overlook in order to get that sought after VC check. Because in some, some folks, they think that it's validating if they have VC money. Now, what a company needs to be is it needs to be able to have a very quick and scalable growth in order to qualify as a VC backable company, right? So the capital infusion of VC needs to accelerate the growth of the company, which is this J curve, which all VC investors and startup founders should be very aware of. And VC will typically come in at an inflection point. And to Wolf's point, sometimes if you aren't necessarily a great fit for venture, backable or venture dollars, if there's such a strategic fit with the VC that's going to open up a ton of business development doors or intro you to a great potential team members, and that could be uh, another reason why you'd consider venture. But uh, a lot of folks think that they need it when they actually don't. So make sure that uh, you're, you're positioning yourself in a way that makes it attractive to get venture and that you actually need it before you approach VCs. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Wolf. And that leads us into our next question about the responsibilities of a venture capital manager. Uh, could you please explain what the responsibilities are? Yeah. Um, so you give money. That's you know pretty pretty clear. So for in terms of the relationship, I'll, I'll focus on the relationship with a general partner, a VC fund manager, and a startup, for example. So we write the check. And historically, that's based, that's been it. When VC was first ideated and, and started deploying checks into companies, there wasn't a ton of additional assistance provided. That has changed drastically, especially in a very competitive VC landscape. So there's a ton of platform plays, for example, that VCs have started to offer to startups, whether it be assisting them in their go-to-market strategies, mentorship, advising them, introducing them to other business development opportunities, running full accelerators that are a part of the VC offering, et cetera. And that kind of value add uh, addition to just capital has really set a lot of venture capital firms apart from, from their peers. Now, there are still pure index funds that just deploy capital and don't have the capacity to actually work with each individual founder. So as a founder, you need to think long and hard about the value add in addition to the capital you get from VCs and investors and take that into consideration when you're kind of lining up your pipeline for who to target. 
I, that, that's also spot on. Um, from a technical standpoint, what we're chasing rainbows and the pride fund do is we raise funds from LPs and that's everything from high net worth individuals to uh, all, all the way up to organizations and endowments and, and different groups like that. But then we have a fiscal responsibility to make sure that we're good stewards of those dollars so that we're investing those those dollars into companies which give the best chances of providing a good return for our um, investors, regardless of which, which group they're with. Uh, so from a technical standpoint, that's where we're at. And so we, in, in to, to Patrick's point, step one is making sure you're investing in the right company. But step two is making sure that those companies are as successful as they can be. And, and that's where Chasing Rainbows and the Pride Fund and some of our siblings are are, are very much differentiated from the traditional standpoint. Um, when when you're operating the way that, that Patrick's fund does or our fund does, we have a smaller group of companies which we can look at for that initial um, um, pipeline. Now, I would argue, and I believe Patrick of Binwood as well, uh, that we could have a hundred of funds like ours and still not be able to take care of all of the amazing businesses led by the LGBTQIA plus community. It's just harder to find all of those. And so at least with the pride fund, our goal is to change the industry and to get all of the funds to realize that it is good business for them to invest more diversely. So that adds an extra level to our plates beyond what a traditional VC would have to do. And, and that's really kind of a beautiful thing because our job is to help support the companies, uh, to Patrick's point, to do whatever we need to do to get them to the best level of success possible. And that does a lot of things. The first thing that it does is it gets us great returns or it, it gets us greater returns for our investors. Second, it empowers and uplifts the companies we invest in more than just taking a check. Well, even if it is thesis aligned, we will never invest into a company unless we can provide more value than just our money, because otherwise we can't help be a partner in their success. Um, and and the, the biggest thing is it creates that FOMO for uh, our more traditional uh, colleagues in the venture space to say, why weren't they invested into these companies? Why, why did it take these emerging managers to come on in to show them that uh, these kinds of beautiful rocks are the ones worth flipping over. And so by success of Chasing Rainbows and the Pride Fund and others, we can really move the industry further faster. So our technical job is to help support the companies and get good returns for our investors. But the beauty of it really comes in all of the pieces in between to, to really help support our friends. Thank you. And now for our guests out there that decide that they do think that venture capitalism is right for them, um, could you give some advice on how to prepare to show a potential investor when seeking funding? I'll kick this one off by just saying to do, to do homework. There are more venture funds out there today than there have ever been. I, I guess you could argue a year ago there were more than today, but in general, we, we're there are a lot more options and venture funds are all very, very different. Even chasing rainbows in the pride fund who have an extremely similar thesis are still very different. It's, it's figuring out where the, where the industries lie, where the support is, what stage you're at. And for anyone who's listening, that that's not familiar stage really just means how far along are you to need the venture funding to be able to get to where you're going. Um, and, and then also based on geography there, we, we get requests from amazing founders that we, we love them as people and we want to support them. And in many ways we do support them, but for example, we do not invest in, um, in companies outside the United States. And so when someone reaches out to us and they say, Hey, we're, we're this amazing company, uh, but we're based somewhere else, we already know that we're going to be able to help them, but we're not going to be able to invest in them. And if they did some research and, and, and worked around, they would see that we don't. Whereas Chasing Rainbows, I believe you have an allocation, uh, which you mentioned, 
for international investment. And, and another example would be, uh, we invest only in things which we believe that we can support beyond the dollars. And so we've been fairly public that there are uh, things we don't invest in because we don't know enough to help, such as uh, a lot of Web3, a lot of blockchain. We love those companies. We know they're the future. It's just not our focus right now. Uh, but we know the funds which are only investing in those. And so if if you're looking for venture funding, not only should you figure out if you're venturable, which I'd love, Patrick, to, to continue to elaborate on, but also that you're talking to the right uh, funds. Because yeah. in, a, in a world of AI being so strong, we can't cut through the clutter as well as we used to be able to. And so um, a, a well put together expression, almost like a cover letter of this is why we know we're a good fit for your thesis and your stage is, is very, very helpful for us to be able to get the conversation started, right? I couldn't agree more. Preparation is key. Doing your homework and and coming at it with, with kind of like a fine tooth, tooth comb prepared to talk about how our thesis fits them as a company. That's super useful for, for me, for example. So if you Google LGBTQ plus venture capital investors, you're gonna see Pride Fund, you're gonna see Chasing Rainbows, you're gonna see our, our sibling funds as well. And when you approach us, you need to, to be able to articulate why you are a good fit for us and also do research on the individual that you're having a call with. Uh, I, if there's like a little affinity is huge in venture capital, right? If you're able to establish some sort of credibility based off of in my LinkedIn, it says I'm a marathon runner. The, I'm a, it's kind of a test actually, the amount of times that a founder will be like, oh, I just came back from a run and it'll be like blah, blah, blah. Cause they know that I'm a marathon runner and that will get me engaged in the conversation, which I pick up on. I'm aware that this is all kind of a psychological game in, in some ways is a great way to get you brownie points when you're chatting with an investor. Uh, even figuring out where they're from, if they're from, I'm from Pennsylvania, for example, if someone mentioned something or coming from CMU or University of Pittsburgh or something, it's it's a great way to, to get in. So that's just setting up affinity with an investor. Now, in terms of what I expect you to have prepared for our initial conversation, be able to talk about your market the total addressable market, your competitors, what exists out there, what is your differentiator and what is your moat and be able to back it up in some sort of way. That is, that is baseline something that I need to hear you be able to talk about in that conversation. Um, if I can Google a list of competitors while we're having our first chat and ask you about them and you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's a, that's a, a big red flag. So preparation in terms of getting yourself set up for success, engaging with the individual and the firm on, as a brand, but also be able to answer these kind of basic questions as well. And story, the final thing I'll say is storytelling. Founders forget that storytelling and narrative creation is can make or break you. If you're all over the place and it's hard for me to follow what you're talking about, so by the end of the presentation, I, I got nothing out of it and I don't even have questions because I don't know where to begin, then you've wasted everyone's time. So being able to, to craft an engaging story is, is quite important and run it through like your partner or your friends or whomever, someone who's out of the business because you get so sucked into your business that you forget that other people don't understand it. So bring in a third party to hear you pitch to them and take their feedback and, and that'll help you immensely. Thank you, those were great tips. And I want to circle back around to communication because I think it's so important. I know we've touched, you both have touched on it, um, but maybe if you had any other tips to add regarding um, how to best communicate with a venture capitalist and particularly in Wolf, I know you had mentioned AI and how that might be affecting responses. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I want to point out is that there is a lot of inbound deals, which which we get all the time. Uh, not not just Patrick and I and our teams, but but everybody. And we really want to find those great companies. I mean, the, the the funnest part of my job is finding the companies and helping them succeed. 
Um, that being said, anybody can purchase a list of 2,000 VCs emails and it used to be that they would just send a BCC email or they'd use some kind of service so it didn't look like a BCC that just has your name and then you'd know reading through it, oh, this person is sending it to absolutely everyone. They weren't mentioning, hey, I just got back from Iran, I'm from Pennsylvania. They were just saying, okay, we are, um, we are at this stage, we are doing this, we are doing that. Uh, with, with AI coming in, it's a little bit harder to tell whether someone has put in their homework or not. Uh, there, there are services and there are programs where they're able to really fool you. So if someone can put together a three paragraph intro and then they can spin it up through a specific AI program and it can find those details. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone finds out that I'm in Columbus, Ohio. And the first thing that comes on is, do you like eating at Schmitz, which is like one of our famous restaurants in German Village, or uh, you, you start to see the same ones pop up just because it ties in. And while I appreciate the um, ambition and the innovation that that has created in order to make it easier, it's hard for us to cut through the clutter. And if, if we end up having four meetings a day, which is how we normally have it as our team because it's my favorite part and it turns out that three of those meetings were set and they actually are not fits but they fooled us to be fits that's taking some opportunities away from three other companies which really are the right fit um the best joke in our office is that uh we'll have people reach out and then when we tell them what our thesis is as the follow-up they'll say oh don't worry we've hired a gay employee so we're we're totally fit within you um and it it has made things a little bit trickier. Um, I don't believe it's leveling the playing field. I, I think that it requires us to get smarter and stronger with the different technologies which are out there. Um, but as far as communication is concerned, you can't AI your way around doing enough homework and figuring out who we've invested into. And um, the... The top two recommendations that I can get as a um, investor are one from our LPs. If an LP sends me something and says, hey, I've looked at this, this person reached out to me. I think you should consider it. I will absolutely consider it. Well, we'll, we'll dive in. It won't always be right. In fact, often it will not be the right fit, but we'll definitely pay attention to it. But the second and the by far more important way that we receive them is if one of our founders writes us and says, this company reached out to me and I really think it's cool. I think they'd add a lot to the network. Um, would you take a meeting with them? Uh, 10 times out of 10, I'm going to do that. And I guess the third would be if another fund reaches out to me and they say, we've looked at this and we've done it. I mean, we, we all talk all the time and we don't talk to be negative. We talk to be positive so that if, if a company comes to us and we think that they're great, I want to get as many great partners on that cap table as possible to be able to say, hey, I think you can add this piece that we cannot add. Uh, Patrick, you're in San Francisco. They need to reach San Francisco. Do you want to do this kind of thing together? Um, so as far as communication, I would find a route that is as direct as possible because getting into our inbox, even if it gets through the spam filter, is not the best way uh, to, to get a real conversation going. How I totally agree. Warm figuring out a, a warm intro way into any of our inboxes or LinkedIn or whatever is a great way for uh, for at least getting a response and setting up a first call. I will say, uh, don't if you do choose to go the cold call route. We actually have a fantastic warehouse deal in our portfolio. Uh, a great founder who reached out coldly got connected and she is absolutely a rock star and you know we're so happy we took that call but the message that we got from her was very well articulated in terms of storytelling engaging the company sounded super cool you know let's let's just check this out check out her material it opened up a door that initial call or that initial message excuse me opened up a door to make us interested 
if we're going to get another AI generated spam message that is so easy to, and I've seen so many identical messages now at this point where it's just in one ear, out the other, on to the next email, won't even respond sometimes because of the amount of inbound that we get. Uh, it's it's not a good way to set yourself up for success, right? So if you if you are able to even like including a little joke, there's there's things that I pick up on. This is me personally that I like to see in an inbound message, right? Um, and have your cold paragraph that describes your company, but maybe have one or two just personalized messages and in cold inbound. Otherwise, you'd be surprised that the network you don't realize you have, especially within an insular LGBTQ plus type community where you might be able to ping somebody who's a member of start out or or out in tech or lesbian to tech or whatever that knows one of us uh wolf's team or my team or, or another investor who's a part of the, the community and just ask them for an intro people typically like to help other people whether it be via mentorship or intros and there's great double opt-in tools these days so it's de-risked in every possible way uh, just just don't be afraid to ask and I just want to put a point on what Patrick said. Um, I believe a third of our entire portfolio right now came through the start out network. And, um, and that was because we formed relationships with a lot of them and uh, a mentor will see something and then they'll truly shoot us a text. In fact, normally they'll text Denzel and I at the same time and say, Hey, we think that this one really is the right fit for you because of X, Y, and Z. They might be too early for you, but can you start that relationship? Can you start that conversation? Um, and then also the NGLCC, out in tech, everything that was mentioned. Um, these are tools which are created to help us level the playing field and to help create greater access. And whether you're at the right stage for venture or not, if you're a founder that's within the community, there are definitely things you want to check out because it not only will they give you introductions, but they'll also give you a, a very deep dive into what to be looking for and how to be participating throughout the entire life cycle, whether you go venture or not. Thank you. Yeah, that's some some great advice. And speaking about uh, timing, um, at what point should someone start looking for an investor or funding? I, I love to see traction. Uh, so I, I guess just baseline, you, if you're at the idea stage, you're not doing it full time, you still are working somewhere else and you have this interesting idea for a little startup, I wouldn't reach out to venture capital funds at that stage. I would wait until you have an MVP, a minimum viable product, you, you have built the app, you have started to test it perhaps in a small group of people, You've either bootstrapped it if you're able, or maybe gotten an angel investor to back you for the first iteration of the product or service that you're building. And then you have data that will indicate that it's working, there's product market fit or whatever. And at that stage, that's when I would potentially reach out to VCs. What I look for in terms of traction could be anything. If you're already post revenue, if you already, if you have paying customers, that's fantastic. That's a good proof point. If you have letters of intent or LOIs from partners lined up, uh, typically I look for more than one, so two or three, whether they be um, corporate partners or large firms that are interested in working with you once the product or service is fully built out. So basically it's a non-binding document for you to get there. Uh, another thing is IP protection. If you have some, if a patent has been filed and that way I know that it's secure and you're gonna be able to build on that because you own it. That's a good indicator of traction for me. Um, pilots, if you're in the midst of launching with a strategic partner and you're getting good feedback and data from a pilot program, that's also huge. And as a venture investor, I wanna see one of those things, if not several of those things, to decide if you're gonna be, uh, if we're gonna continue with the due diligence process. I, I agree with all of that. Um, and then also know who you're, who you're pitching because we both cut checks really early. Um, we're not necessarily the first check. We love seeing angel syndicates in there before us, but if you're, if you don't do your homework and you end up pitching someone who only invests at a later stage, yeah. then you're, you need a whole lot more than that. Like we, 
we're we're going to be less cumbersome than if you're going out there and you're trying to raise on a let's say twenty five million dollar valuation. Um, you're going to have to have a whole lot more put together in that, and it can't just be on a dream at, at that stage. Uh, but but I I agree entirely. That's that's really what we're looking for. We want to see some traction. We want to see some understanding. And we also want to see a real plan. Like the use of funds at the early stage is one of the top three most important things right next to like founder fit and, and addressable market is we do not want to see us cutting you a check and that check only allowing you to tread water to be able to keep going towards what you're doing. We'll want to know that it's able to get you to the milestone, which either you can get that great customer or you can get that wonderful partner, or you can raise a larger round or you can hire those people that you need. Um, at the early stage, which is where we both swim, um, really letting us know that our money is an investment in growth instead of an investment in time is, is really essential. Um, and, and also, uh, the IP is huge. Uh, if, if you're coming to us and your product is almost fully reliant on having a patent to protect it, you, you don't need to have a dozen pieces of protected IP in order to have that full fence that you will need when you go to later stages. But we'll know that we'll need to know that you're planning to, and we'll need to know how you're planning to do it. And, and that should be a significant use of your funds if that's going to be a, um, a significant factor in uh, standing out from the crowd. Thank you. Yeah, Patrick, I, you had also mentioned um, patents. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add about how intellectual property helps in securing funding? Yeah, I've uh, I've spoken with founders that have no idea what I'm talking about when I mention intellectual property, and that it's just run the other way. You know, like if 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 someone has oh, well, obviously that's not what I do. I'll be a little bit more educational and instruct them to go to the USPTO or, or perhaps like deal with a or engage with a patent lawyer or attorney. Um, but it's it's so important, specifically in a hyper competitive startup market where people are popping up left and right, offering a similar product or service. If your differentiator is is something that can be protected with with some sort of IP protections, then do it because that's going to make sure that that the money that I give you has a higher likelihood of. Uh, helping you be successful because your business can beat out these other competitors because they can't get to the same point that you where you are because of these intellectual pro property protections, right? So it's it's pretty it's pretty important and at least have a uh, it on your roadmap, right? So like indicate to me that you thought about it and that at this point this is when you're going to act start registering or, or going through the process of of getting all those IP protection aspects in, in mind. And I'll just jump on with one of my favorite jokes, which is that uh, Shark Tank is to venture capital as Indiana Jones is to archaeology. And there, there are a lot of things with that where, yeah, it's glorified and really it is very specific angel investing or, or whatnot. But the one thing which I love by far the most about Shark Tank, in addition to getting everyone jazzed up about becoming entrepreneurs, is that they do focus on that IP part. And if if someone comes to us and they say, it's not patentable, but it is patentable, or I can't get that trademarked, but you could get it trademarked, um, that is probably the brightest red flag that they're not going to do what they need to do and they're just looking for money to survive. 